uh, welcome everybody. Welcome at this lecture of Studium Generale. I'm Rob van Duin, head of the Office of Studium Generale, also program maker. Um, I've been doing this work for quite a long time and I remember actually just now when I walked up this hill that we had maybe 25 years ago a lecture on the computer Deep Blue uh, and this professor was so happy that finally uh, this computer got to beat the world champion in chess. And that was a development of, I think, about 10 years when they first started thinking about a computer that could beat a world champion of chess. Uh, how quick has it been going in the past 20, 25 years? And it seems like it's uh, accelerating. If you look at I, uh, AI and what is happening um, uh, into deep learning now, where we seem to be able to maybe make machines that have their own sense of learning and uh, maybe even thinking at the end. Um, that, that sometimes uh, fears us or fears people. Like, okay, what's going to happen? Where are we going to end with computers uh, who can do these things and think themselves, what if they are going to act by, uh, by themselves? Uh, for now, it's often, of course, what we put into it is what we get out of it. And so it's also the responsibility of people who are working on AI to think of the consequences of these machines and what they're thinking. And, and this um, uh, uh, made me stumble on um, a lecture uh, of Professor Jan Boerser on responsible machines. Because what do we, do we think when developing these AI, uh, artificial intelligence, um, and these machines, um, do we think still about uh, what the consequences are or uh, what ethics are or maybe moral dilemmas? Or are we so happy with the progress we're making uh, so quickly nowadays that we seem to uh, uh, not see the overview anymore and ask these questions? Um, over dinner we already had uh, uh, the, uh, the talk about um, uh, him being uh, uh, somebody who worked as an um, a, an a um, computer, scientist. computer scientist, right? Uh, and he changed into philosophy. That is actually two different worlds that he worked in, and that is a really different way of looking at these issues of these developments in AI. So I'm very happy that Jan Bruse uh, came from Amsterdam Utrecht, a uh, university in Utrecht where he works, and I'm going to read out my. Uh, piece of paper here. He's professor of logical methods in AI uh, at the Department of Philosophy and Religious Study at Utrecht University. He's going to talk for about an hour, maybe a little bit more, and then, of course, there's time for a Q&A. Please welcome Professor Jan Broers. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to talk about this topic, uh, responsible machines. Uh, I had my inaugural talk uh, in spring of this year and it was, had the same title. So what I did for this talk is uh, to adapt uh, my inaugural talk. Uh, first of all, I translated things to English because it was in Dutch. Uh, and uh, yeah, so you will have, you will have a, 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 an executive summary of what I said there, I think. So what we, what I will discuss is first, so this is here, you see the contents of what I'm going to try to d explain to you this evening. Uh, and I start with the question, is artificial intelligence actually possible? I will explain later why I do that. Then I will go on to talk a little bit about responsibility, what I think responsibility is about, how to define it maybe. Uh, and then formal logic, uh, because I think that formal logic uh, has a very big role to play in making artificial intelligence responsible. And then if there is time left, <coughs> uh, then I will maybe uh, go into some more specific uh, cases where we were specific cases of AI applications where responsibility is obviously a huge uh, concern. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then I will have reached the end of uh, today's uh, talk. Uh, so, okay, the first, so uh, what you see here is that I first want to talk about the starting question. Is 
artificial intelligence actually possible? Uh, maybe it's a little bit strange to ask this question in this lecture because it's such a big question that obviously the whole lecture should have been about this question. But there is an intimate relation obviously with the question of whether machines can be responsible. Because I think in order to be responsible you need at least to be a little bit intelligent or well actually it is not very clear what people mean when they say is artificial intelligence possible what they mean by intelligence so but but what is I think uh, clear is that we need somehow an, an answer to this question first before we can get get an opinion on the question whether these machines can actually bear certain kinds of responsibility like we do or whether it's another kind of responsibility. So the, these questions, I have to address this question and I have an opinion on this question that is not the mainstream opinion, I think. Um, so when people ask me, is artificial intelligence possible? Uh, then I always say that depends. Where is my, yeah. That depends. Where does it depend on? It depends actually on what is artificial? What is possible? What do you mean by when, when something is possible? And what do you mean by intelligence? Do you mean strong intelligence or weak intelligence? So all these words in this question, is artificial intelligence possible? You can ask further questions about. Well, and I'm now not even talking about the word is, because even for... <laughs> In even you can ask questions about that word, but I won't do that. I will just assume that we all know what is means. But, well, what do we mean by artificial? By artificial we mean with the kind of machines that we have, well, like the machine that I have here on this, uh, on this table, uh, the kind of machine that, that runs the presentation. That's what we mean by artificial. We do not mean like genetic manipulation, which is also very artificial, but it is biological. So when, when people ask this question, they often mean by artificial it, uh, the kind of machines that we have here and the general term for that, so the general model for that kind of machine is the Turing machine. Well, even that is not completely right. So I, d I don't know what your background is, but if you have a background in computer science or maybe philosophy like I have, then you understand that the machine over there does is even less powerful than a Turing machine and while Turing machines are the general model of computation that we all work with. Um, okay, but it is important to recognize that first that that's what we're talking about, that kind of machines, not any anything else artificial like biological programming or whatever. You, there's all kinds of things that you can think of, but that's what we mean. Well, what do we mean by possible in this question? Well, possible means can so can well when you're a philosopher then you know there's many different kinds of possibility there's possibility in the sense of metaphysical possibility or logical possibility i mean so logical possibility means something that is not inherently inconsistent something that is maybe completely imaginary that would never exist in the real world but it is logically consistent so we can think of it so it's in that sense possible um so what kind of possibility do we actually mean when we talk about is artificial intelligence possible? I think we mean something like somewhere in the future our technology will result in an actual system that is like us. So it's like, it, so it, that it involves physical possibility, it must be physical possible otherwise somewhere in the future it will not be there. Um, and it must be technological possible. We must find the techno technologies in order to make that. So that's kind of possibility we're talking about. Okay, so what do I think? And, and then the last word is, of course, intelligence. I didn't discuss that yet. And there I want to distinguish between weak intelligence and strong intelligence. It's a distinction by the philosopher John Searle. You must have heard of him. Uh, well, maybe for the wrong reasons also, but as for a good reason to hear from him is that he put forward the idea of the Chinese room argument. I'm not going to talk about the Chinese room, don't be afraid. Um, uh, I'm not going to talk about that, but he made a distinction be between strong AI and weak AI. And strong AI, that is, well, maybe let's begin, let's begin with weak AI. Weak AI is the, is this the stuff like 
making uh, an intelligent chess program in order to beat the world chess champion. Uh, Rob already mentioned Kasparov and we will see on the next slide that that was a very good choice. Um, uh, okay, so that is the weak AI, the kind of, m of like say limited intelligent tasks for which you need a computer and you can program it in order to solve that intelligent task and then that's it and then you have you have a kind of intelligence because for the task that task required to have uh, you, uh, you you had to have intelligence to in order to solve that task um, but that's not what we mean by strong AI strong AI is just the kind of so and then maybe it's not even no no longer even about intelligence so strong and strong AI is like it, it's the whole package it's consciousness qualia uh, the the subjective experiences that come with the kind of thing you and i the kind of mental capacities you and i have uh, the, the kind so all the men if, if you want to have a machine that has all that mental capacities then you call that strong ai so that includes consciousness that includes seeing meaning in symbols that includes having emotions that includes knowing how to behave in a social context all those kind of things that you and I, to a certain extent, are capable of doing. Okay, so we need to answer the question, is strong AI possible? Uh, and I think I want to answer that question first, because otherwise I cannot talk about responsibility. What do I think? So this is the strong AI question. Can we, with our current technology, uh, the, uh, the kind of machines that are on the table there, create machines with mental capacities that match those of humans? very big question and here comes the introduction of Rob here you see that's indeed exactly 25 years ago well <laughs> you you were right um, uh, or, or at least it's it's corresponds with the information that I have um, uh, exactly 25 years ago uh, uh, Kasparov uh, was beaten by uh, Deep Blue and here you see the picture from the Volkskrant that I then I saw I I was then uh, very young, and I, uh, I have with a scissors, I, I took this from the from the newspaper, and there you see this is the picture from that. I d you can't find it on the internet actually. Um, so he was very surprised. So this computer beat me, uh, and uh, and I already said, yeah, okay. So this computer beat Kasparov as the world chess champion, but that is for me weak AI. That is not strong AI. It is not that this machine, in order to beat Kasparov had to have consciousness or you can you can imagine how these machines work how these chess machines works they 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 simply look ahead in the decision tree that is uh, any game play in chess uh, they look ahead they evaluate uh, certain positions they give a number to it and they they, they put a lot of uh, um, computation power so they throw at it and then you can always win from a human because the human they simply you simply beat the human on the aspect of computation power which is part of being able to be in play intelligently in chess so is that intelligence mm, well okay uh, from an input output perspective yes because yeah you do an intelligent task and you do something that requires intelligence and you 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 beat the world chess champion but is it strong ai i would say no uh, okay um, arguments against strong AI. So I think strong AI is impossible. Strong AI in the sense the kind of AI that must run on the kind of machines that we have there. I think that's impossible and that is a surprisingly well how, how, should, I, how should I say this? I mean it used to be maybe a majority position but it is well well, we could we can just ask here in the in the in the room who thinks don't be intimidated by me i i think it's not possible but there must be many people who think it is possible so who think it's who thinks it's not possible like me okay should i conclude that all the others think it's possible or should i ask to raise hands so raise hands if you think it's possible okay that's very good you see it's evenly distributed we have a 50-50 um, <coughs> opinion, which is very interesting, isn't it? This is just one of these uh, problems, one of these things 
that that are so mysterious that half of the population thinks one direction and the other half of the population thinks in the other direction and they both think because that's my experience that it is obvious that they are right and that, 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 that there is even they they do not even have to give arguments for it because it's ob obviously the case that it is like this and the other people also think it's obviously the case like this but they cannot both be true so that's very interesting um, of course this has been debated already for for well since 1950 let's say even before that so it's it's an old question so it's already 70 years in the in the literature but there is no uh, no answer yet um, and I think with the success of artificial intelligence people are nowadays tending more towards the answer that strong AI actually is possible that's what I see around me all the young students they come in they so when when they come study uh, AI in Utrecht where I teach um, all the young students think well that makes sense doesn't it I mean that's maybe part of the reason why they are there in the first place so they are very optimistic and they think strong AI is possible and uh, maybe they are even the ones who can con can contribute to it I don't think so so there's all kinds of arguments for my position um, first argument the the Ada Lovelace uh, argument and you must have known and it is a very intuitive argument you you must have thought of it it is just the idea that these machines are completely deterministic their output is completely determined by their input so there cannot be any free choice while you and I can actually uh, do what we want actually I could now just go out here I could just here I could just go away and leave you here for the rest of the evening I could do that or I could stay here I really have a choice and it depends on what I do it doesn't depend on anything else it doesn't depend on my environment or whatever I have that choice computers don't have that computers just do what they are told it's an old objection uh, and of course many philosophers nowadays think that humans are exactly also exactly like that and uh, the compatibilists uh, think that nature is completely deterministic and that everything can be explained in a deterministic way okay that's a, a very big philosophical discussion I'm not a determinist I think there's real choice and I'm a libertarian in that sense so not a political libertarian but a philosophical libertarian uh, but let's not go all in, in into that it's an argument that I wanted to mention second argument and that's the argument that I will spell out a little bit further on later on in the slides and I'm now I'm only mentioning it is the private language argument by Wittgenstein it's a very complicated difficult to understand argument and that's actually why I put it forward to give you also something to chew on let's say or something to really think about I will do that in the next slides um, third argument that's a very common one that's the, chi the Chinese room argument you must have heard of it uh, and it is uh, I don't like the Chinese room argument at all the way that it is presented by Searle uh, but I do like the the message behind it and he later only reformulated it and what it comes down to is let's say okay the idea that uh, a machine is completely syntactic uh, it manipulates symbols and nothing more and you cannot have meaning arising from only symbol manipulation that's what it comes down to and the idea that that what we are doing inside here uh, our phenomenal experience or the kind of things that we feel etc that that is all the result of just simple manipulation that is very hard to uh, to believe somehow that intuition that is being exploited in the Chinese room argument and in the uh, idea that uh, some, s syntax manipulation is not sufficient for real semantics like you and I have but I'm not going to do that argument um, there are many more arguments actually against the strong AI claim for instance um, well uh, arguments related to qualia uh, subjective experiences emotions self-awareness where does that come come from in a machine formal formal limits to computation maybe you have heard that uh, so Turing uh, Turing's result that not everything is computable or Gödel's result that not everything 
uh, is deductible in a logical system. Uh, uh, I'm not going into those results, but there are mathematical results that actually show that the kind of machine that I have there on that table has limits. That it can, that there are problems that it cannot solve. And that is used as an argument against artificial intelligence because those problems that the machine can't solve, we already solved them. That's, well, that's very roughly the <laughs> argument. If you know it, then you know that what I'm saying now is incorrect. Uh, but uh, what I just wanted to say here now is that there are these formal mathematical results that say that there are limits to the kind of things a machine like that can do. And probably, or maybe, what we are is more than what the machine is because we, have, we don't have those limits. That's the argument. Okay. What I wanted to say extra on this slide is what are actually the arguments in favor? I mean, 50% of the people here are, were actually saying that they believe that strong AI is possible. But what is the argument in favor of thinking that strong AI is po Ah, there's somebody who's <laughs> who dares. Good. I'll try first. Experience, okay. Well, uh, First of all, we were, every one of us were like children. And to be honest, we were like close to being an unintelligent an, an uh, people. Like, yeah. so we were learning, yeah. learning, like if we are talking about AI, it was a kind of reinforcement learning. Right. So uh, we were experimenting and we are now here listening to you and we are understanding what you're saying mm -hmm. so why machines cannot do the same like in the future of course and uh, about the first argument um, the question is do we really have a uh, free choice because maybe it is a consequence of the past actions like you uh, were uh, discussing about that you can s you can circle around and it's your free choice but what if it's just a consequence of you thinking about something in the past right okay I'm going to give an answer to the first point not to the second point but uh, but thanks for uh, for giving an argument, you say, okay, we are uh, a strong, strong artificial intelligence is possible because they are learning algorithms. And because they are learning, why would there, I, so I, I, I changed your argument a little bit, why would there be any limits to the learning? Well, I mean, we also learned everything, so why can't a machine learn everything? Well, can a machine learn to feel emotions? Can, yeah, okay, then you say, can it learn how to become self-aware? Can, fr from who? <laughs> yeah, I think the must, okay, okay, it's a good argument. Let's, let's stop the argument, yeah, here, because otherwise I cannot finish the talk. Well, one. Okay, uh, well, uh, if we uh, didn't have our parents around, would well, we become uh, who we are? Like, I if not parents or relatives or other people around us who actually teach us how to behave in like social environment, uh, how to react on something, what emotions should we feel when, for example, some small animal is dying mm -hmm. like it's also we also learned it in like kind of ah. <laughs> okay i see the, we definitely learned it that's true but can a machine also learn it that's the question and i i think not
Okay. I, I have to stop here because I'm now going to give another argument. But you see, this has the, the, uh, the potential to, uh, <laughs> to draw in a lot of uh, discussion, etc. And I love it. But I, I need to stop it here because otherwise uh, we cannot continue the, the, the part on responsibility. But let me first give an argument. It's a complicated argument, but I like the argument that you won't like <laughs> because it's against your position. Okay, what's that argument? Uh, okay, no, this is not that argument. Actually, I forgot that this was in between. I have a here. Ah, oh, there's music even. Okay, that that was my way too hard, so that's why I, I put it down. What you saw there was a Turing machine, uh, and, and a Turing machine in action. And you know that the Turing machine is the general model of computation. Everything that can be computed can be somehow translated to, to Turing machines. And when I see that 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 little uh, movie, that little film of the Turing machine, I thin, find it very hard to imagine that that kind of machines are capable of all the kind of things that we can do. That's not a good argument, but I wanted to show it to you, and I, uh, just maybe that at some point that when you're watching that little clip that you're all thinking the same. Now let's now go to the argument: uh, Wittgenstein on language and rules. As, and it's it's a very difficult argument. Um, it has, I think, it's not even published by someone. Of, um, I, I don't know actually whether I thought of it myself or whether I heard uh, I heard somebody s uh, explaining this to me. That's not even clear. Um, but Wittgenstein's second philosophy. So he had his first philosophy that was on the Tractatus. It was all about logic and all very precise. Uh, his second, uh, his second uh, philosophical thoughts, they were on language games. So he, th so he said, language is a game with symbols and meaning. Uh, so when we, um, so I'm, I'm now using language, you roughly understand what I say, uh, and the symbols are here. Uh, well, that's the kind, is the words that I that I, that I utter, and you hear them, and uh, but but you can also write them down in books, etc. And it is a game. Um, and we play this with, with each other and this language is intermediates between us and it connects us somehow. It connects my mind to yours and in between there is language and uh, the meaning is somehow in between and I attach meaning to words, you attach meaning to words. We know the rules of that game somehow uh, because if somebody makes uh, an, uh, a mistake we correct him. So, so sometimes people make mistakes uh, systematic mistakes and then we correct them. That's what, what we can do because we then know, ah, no, he's now using language in the wrong way or he's using it, uh, that meaning is not right, we need to, to show him how, what the right thing is. Yeah? That, so that's, that's what Wittgenstein says, it's essential. If we can't show each other how to use language correctly by some, in some way or another, then it is not, then it is something else than language. Okay, so it is possible to make systematic mistakes and others can point us to them. That's what I said. So that means that a private language where every thought, so now you have to think about your inner thoughts, let's say the inner movie that plays in your head, and those are, those are all thoughts. And maybe you can even put words to those thoughts. And then maybe you can think that is like a language, like a language of thought. And people uh, like uh, um, uh, Jerry Fodor thought that, it, that that's how it works. So that's how we can program intelligence in a language of thought. So maybe all, all this is, is the case that the kind of thing that is going on inside your head, that it is all these thoughts, one following up on the other, that it is like a language. And in this language, it's like a computational language or something like that, where, where, where one thought provokes the other and that there are rules for that. And that it is like that, that it is a private language. Um, <coughs> a private language where thought mass matches one to one to an internal symbol representation is impossible because we cannot point ourselves to systematic mistakes. If we make a systematic mistakes in our own private language, in our own thoughts, we cannot point ourselves to that because it is what we are thinking. We cannot think in another thought than we are thinking. So the, uh, the private language idea of 
there is a language going on in which it we use in terms of which we think and that is what is going on inside our head that's what the internal meaning is of our thoughts that's impossible according to the idea that language is a game where we can where we can point each other to systematic mistakes and then you see immediately okay applying this to AI there cannot be a language of thought like the folder uh, Jerry Fodor uh, suggests and it also goes against what is called the physical symbol system hypothesis that's the idea that we the old-fashioned idea maybe that we can program intelligence in a machine just by if, if we know how this mechanism of thoughts if we, if we know how it works and we know how which thought provokes which other thought and we put that in a language a computer language and we program that language in the machine <coughs> that ID cannot work according to Wittgenstein's ID how language works because that is the kind of if, if, the, if it is like that and if, if the machine runs this language and then every uh, run of, 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 of that language one in one, one in one matches having thoughts of a certain kind that is impossible according to the private language argument because it would imply that there is a private language namely that computer language that implements all these thoughts and all these intelligence considerations and that is not how language functions according to Wittgenstein's second philosophy okay <coughs> It's a complicated argument. Let's see what, Ludgen, what Wittgenstein, I mean, he is not the most accessible philosopher. Eh? So he's, maybe you have tried some of his texts. It is hard to understand sometimes. But what I just tried to explain you is, I think, in the philosophical investigations in, in 2 under 2. So his, his, his whole philosophy is um, just in 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 the, in, in the form of, of little sen of yeah propositions you could almost say so he just it was not a coherent text but he just uh, put in a proposition a certain smart insight and then went on to the next proposition and wrote that down and this is a proposition two on the two from a philosophical investigation and he says that's why following a rule is a social practice so that is his language game idea so the and uh, uh, following a rule that is a, a language rule huh? So f that's why following a rule is a social practice. And to think one is following a rule is not to follow a rule. So if you think you are following a rule, that is not following a rule because you're thinking about it. And that's why it is not possible to follow a rule privately. Otherwise, thinking one was following a rule would be the same thing as following it. That sounds hard, difficult to understand, but it is his way of trying to explain what I just explained with you, that there cannot be a private language, that we cannot have a computational language that corresponds to our thoughts, to our inner world, to our subjective, uh, well, thinking and, and, and intelligence. And that, that is all needed, of course, for strong AI. Uh, if you really want strong AI, then this machine must have thoughts. It must have an inner world. It must have something uh, inside there. And that is according to Wittgenstein, not possible. Okay, um, let me look, yes, okay, but uh, there's a lot more to say about this and now I'm hesitating whether I should skip this or not. Yeah, I'll go, I'm going to skip this and maybe there will be questions about it later. Let's go to responsibility because that's what this uh, talk was supposed to be about and actually it is about responsibility, but first to understand my position on responsibility, you need to understand that I'm not a strong AI person. So what does that imply? That I think machines cannot be responsible themselves because responsibility, to be responsible, you need to be a person. You need to have an inner world. You need to have feelings. You need to have experiences. You need to have, uh, intelligence is not enough. Uh, intelligence it depends on how you define intelligence but if intelligence is just like computer scientists try to like to define it there is a goal and there is certain you have certain capacities and intelligence like well for instance in the chess game the goal is to beat your opponent and you you have a certain moves and uh, then intelligence is just what are the right moves to beat your opponent many people think that is what intelligence is if that it is then we already have artificial intelligence of course uh, because we have the chess machines and they can do that but I think intelligence involves a little bit more 
Um, <clears throat> okay, and I think that for responsibility, intelligence is important, and intelligence actually, I think we even need uh, strong intelligence or strong uh, strong AI. Okay, but just just to start uh, to think a little bit independently about responsibility, I want to propose to think about responsibility in terms of copies that's an abstract word copies and uniqueness so my claim is um, responsibility asks for uniqueness so you and I we are responsible why are we responsible because we are unique in a sense in a very important sense, namely in the sense that is needed to be to be a responsible person, because but we, you and I, are responsible because we are we unique. Would be, I mean, if I would be a copy of one of you, um, and you would uh, would do something uh, wrong. And I would say, ah, that's that you're not behaving very responsible. Then you say, okay, but I'm just like you. We are, we are the same. We function the same. We are alike because we are built in the same way. So what I do wrong, you would have done exactly the same thing. So that kind of defense is, of course, never okay when you talk about responsibility, because we are we have unique responsibilities because we have unique choices. And we each individually are, certain, are a person um, that is responsible for certain outcomes. And it cannot be that we are copies, because if we are copies, then my responsibility would be your responsibility, and your responsibility would be my responsibility, because there's always the defense, yeah, that's how we are built. I mean, this is, um, uh, if, if we are the same, then there is no personal responsibility, there's only joint responsibility. And that's not the case. We hold each other responsible for what we do because we are not the same. We are, we are different. We are unique. That's very important, I think, and it has not been stressed enough. Um, because what is, what about machines? Well, if you think about machines, here, here there's an Apple store. Uh, I don't know where, whether there's copyright on this picture actually, but uh, um, the point I want to make here is all these machines are exactly the same. They are exactly the same machines. Okay, they might be a little bit different in the sense that they run different programs, but that doesn't really matter. I mean, each machine is exactly the same in the sense that they could run this exactly the same program and then ex also exactly in the same state. So if there is, if you are responsible in one state of a certain program on that same machine, in exactly that same same state, the other machine could also have been. Um, and what is important is, of course, that yeah, if you think about computation, that there is no really not not there's not really something unique about the computer, in the sense that it could be replaced by exactly the same computer, and it would uh, would would it would in all possible ways be indistinguishable. Okay, it would be a different machine in a different matter, but in all other ways, it would be exactly the same thing. So I think these machines cannot be personally responsible for anything. It's always on the on on a higher level, uh, on 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 a computational level or on the level of a program or something like that. Programs can can be somehow be bad or good, but not individually can these machines cannot be bad or good. So that's that's what I. Th so actually, now you could say that I'm ready now with my argument. So I think machines cannot be responsible themselves for two reasons. I think we need strong AI for personal responsibility. And second, I think responsibility and the, the, you, you feel that those two are closely related. I think for responsibility, we need uniqueness. Uh, and uh, exactly because strong AI is not possible, exactly because these machines are limited, they are all copies of each, of each other. Um, exactly because strong AI is not possible, they cannot be responsible and they cannot be unique. But so that's, that's, that's related with each other. That's what I think. So then I could stop here, but I won't, uh, because I gave the, my answer to the title of the, uh, of the lecture, which was 
responsible machines question mark so that the question there in the title is is it possible I think it's not possible because of these two reasons but that is not really satisfactory answer in the sense that of course still we can program our machines in a good way and we can program them in a bad way we can program them such that they do a lot of harm to other people and we can program them in ways that are very beneficial to other people so what is that then is that is, is well okay so that and and there i agree uh, th that we should do we should program the machines of course in ways that show our responsibility with respect to other people so even though the machines they are in between somehow and they cannot be responsible themselves of course we intermediate with each other with each other through those machines and we should of course take care that we do that in the right way and that is extremely difficult for lots of reasons and that is what i think responsible ai is just make programming these machines in ways that uh, well that are most beneficial to everyone uh, and without the idea that they are responsible themselves but the, who's responsible that's all the people uh, yeah involved somehow um, so that's the idea and it is well in a sense an obvious idea um, and uh, of course I, I I think that it is obvious but uh, I'm always surprised that people think otherwise um, okay so what can we do then uh, so if that is the goal to program the machines in ways that are beneficial to us all that they won't harm us and that we can somehow uh, if some, something goes wrong in interaction with a machine that we can at least say ah that was the part of the machine that was that, that went wrong and this guy over there programmed it so he is to blame uh, that kind of thing that it needs to be explainable it needs to be traceable back to let's say the decisions that have been made by people programming the machine etc that's that's the important thing uh, but how do we do that um, well, I have a few slides on that. First, you need to know a little bit about programming. And I don't know actually how much you do know about programming. So that's why I, I will explain a little bit uh, what different kinds of programming there are. So programming is about how to produce output. Outputs in terms of actions or answers or judgments, whatever you want to come out of the machine. So if it's a robot, it's actions. If it is some program uh, on the internet that, that, that provides with some answers, then it's answers or judgments. Uh, that's maybe good or bad uh, thing, kind of things. So he needs to produce those outputs from inputs. So what goes into a computation, something like data, observations or knowledge, uh, some, some represented in certain ways, etc. So that's what programming is, an input-output relation and the go things go in actions or things come out actions answers judgments and things go in data observations knowledge there are three ways of programming machines that i can think of or three general categories of of ways of of doing that kind of thing and the old-fashioned way of doing it is imperative so maybe you have programmed uh, this uh, when you went well for the older people in the audience when they were young maybe they programmed in basic or in pascal or nowadays people were uh, programming java um, and that is the traditional view and it is the uh, imperative way of programming so we have an input and step for step you the program tells you oh if you have this data then add one to it and uh, store it over there uh, uh, okay that is too simple of course but that's the, po the point is that the program is just a step-to-step -step prescription of kinds of operations that you have to do on the data and then at the end you put it out and that and then you the program tells the computer do this with the data then do that with the data then do that then do that then do that and then the thing comes out it's that's why it's called imperative the program tells the computer what to do um, and that's the traditional way of doing it so a less traditional way of doing it is based on invariance so if you have a transformation between input and output the imperative way tells the computer what to change stepwise all the time but you can also say okay if things change then other things stay the same so some things stay invariant there are some properties that hold for all the data th going through the computation that are invariant or something like that um, 
that way of thinking about programming because then the idea is to to program a computer is just to specify declaratively in a long list all the things that stay the same when from input to output and then you let your then the, the there is a, a low level algorithm that actually da operates that and guarantees that that thing is the same so that is an interesting thing the interestingly the the, or, the, the original um, uh, programming language designed for artificial intelligence uh, was such a program or such a programming language that was Lisp. Um, other examples are Prolog. So Prolog uh, is an acronym standing for programming with logic. Uh, so then you specify logically what has to be true for your computation and that's the only thing you do and then the computation runs and then you have input versus output. It's very interesting. Uh, the most modern way of programming is yet completely different and that is deep learning, I would say. So that is based on data. So you have a, a low-level algorithm, uh, well with every, way, every form of program there is a low-level algorithm, also with the first one. Huh? There's something that you, the machine needs to have as a basis and then on top of that you have the higher languages. Um, in deep learning, it's, it's again completely different. What you there do is annotate data. So you give examples. With this input, you need that output. With this input, you need that output. And that's what you, all these examples you give the computer. And then the computer finds out how to, on, on, not on this particular level of that this particular input needs that particular output. It somehow generalizes so that inputs that are like the inputs that it has seen before will be mapped to outputs uh, uh, that are like the outputs that were linked to the same inputs before. You see? That this, so this is a completely different way of thinking about programming based on showing examples and that's the learning that we already dis uh, uh, saw. Uh, so these are three things of uh, programming uh, computers. Uh, and which one is now best for programming responsible machines uh, so that they well i think the, the 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 obviously the one in the middle the one with the invariance the, the declarative one the the one where you can just say this computation needs to obey those and those properties uh, that that is a very good candidate to do this kind of thing uh, <coughs> Okay, so for all three uh, forms of programming, we have this idea of garbage in is garbage out. So all three, so that does that, that does not distinguish them. Uh, the idea that if you put the wrong data in, and the machine has not seen that somehow, then you get garbage out. So in the context of deep learning, uh, you you had this is the, the topic of bias. Uh, you if you put in the wrong data, bias data, then you get bias data out. Uh, that is, is in a sense dangerous, but this danger is also with these other forms of uh, programming. Okay, uh, let's go to formal logic. It's going to be a little bit more abstract now. Um, and I hope I get the main message across. Um, so I talked about programming and I want to use programming in order to make my machines more responsible. But and I. Th I showed you three different forms of programming and I said this middle form, this declarative form where that is about what is invariant when you go from input to output, that's the most promising one when you think about um, uh, making the machines responsible because there you can, well, you, you, you can somehow guarantee that it, that it obeys certain properties, uh, that, that's, it's like safety almost. If you if you do the step for step thing, then how do you guarantee that uh, the right steps are taken? That's not not uh, very clear. And the data way of programming the same the, the same thing. Okay. Um, so some comments on logic. Uh, logic, like computation, is a process between input and output. Logic is not about truth, but it preserves truth. So you know the principle of modus ponens. So modus ponens, that is, if A is true, and if A implies B is true, if these two things are true, then B is true. Yeah? 
So we have two premises, A and A implies B. Logical consequence, B. Two true things go in, a true thing comes out. That's what logic is. It is about what are the rules, what are the principles that preserve truth in the sense that if you put truths in the logic, then only truths come out. So logic is not about truth. Logic says nothing about this is true and this is false. Not at all. The only thing logic does is that it makes sure that if you have found something that is really true and you go start to reason with it, then you end up with something that is really true. That is what logic is. Um, nothing more, not, nothing less. So you, still you don't know about the kind of things that you are reasoning with in logic, you still don't know if they are true. The only thing that you know is that if they are true, then according to the steps that I'm taking in my reasoning, then the output is true. It's very important uh, because, uh, well, you, you see here that it, this almost feels like a computation. Something goes in, something goes out. Logic is like, if what, are in, what goes in is true, then, then what comes out is true. That feels like these computations also, uh, because in computation something goes in and something goes out, and what it, yeah, is that here? Yes, the Curry-Howard correspondence. Actually, mathematicians have shown that they are exactly the same thing. Any computation is like a logic proof. So if you have a logic proof, so lo I, I just told you about modus ponens. If A and A implies B, then B. That is an extremely simple logical proof, of course. They can be much more complicated with lots of premises and, and, and uh, derivation rules, etc. And the Curry-Howard uh, correspondence of isomorphism, um, that is an important uh, mathematical result. They say that they are exactly the same thing. Any computation is like a logic proof, and any logic proof is like a computation. Any computation. Yeah, that sounds mysterious, I understand. So you have to just buy this. <laughs> um, but it says something very fundamental about the kind of things that we can do with those machines on these tables, the kind of computations that we can do, the kind of things that go in and go out, can always be represented as a logical proof. That is fascinating, isn't it? That it's that any computation, even it doesn't matter if you have to do a deep learning thing or whatever, on some level, the kind of computation that they are doing is equivalent with uh, some kind of logical reasoning or some kind of proof. Okay. Um, and now comes something that is, uh, I mean, I want to use those machines to say something about responsibility, about ethics, to calculate something uh, ab about what is the right thing to do in a certain situation or something like that. And then, and here you see that there is maybe a problem because how could machines produce ethical moral responsibility outputs by reasoning and or computation? Because the only thing they can do if truth goes in, then truth comes out. That's, that's the kind of logic, lo the logical thing. Um, so how to do that? Uh, this is this another example about uh, what logic is. Uh, and uh, well, this is uh, a, a pizza uh, box that uh, was when I was in Antwerp or something, and I like that somehow very much. So that that is not necessarily wrong uh, logical reasoning. It is just that if fries are French, then pizza is Belgian. Fries are, of course. Um, um, not French, according to the Belgians, um, so that is just false. So here, uh, a false thing goes in, and then a false thing goes out. That's okay, according to logic. I mean, if there's something false, then everything follows. That's that's not a problem. And so this is still log this is logically okay. Logic is not about whether it whether it is true that fries are French. It's only about preserving truth, and this is still, from a logic perspective, okay to say. Okay, that was just uh, going back to actually to the previous slide. So what I wanted to go get at is this slide. Um, and this slide is about uh, Hume's guillotine. Maybe you've heard of it before. So Hume, a philosopher, uh, said, when we think about moral judgments, 
moral propositions, we cannot, it is the case that we cannot, it cannot be the case that they are derived from uh, factual uh, information or factual propositions. So if you think about whether something is good or something is bad, it cannot be that we have come to that kind of conclusion, whether something is good or whether something is bad, by starting to reason for something for, from something that is factually the case. This is somehow related to the uh, naturalistic fallacy. Maybe you heard about that. It is like maybe the kind of reasoning, for instance, uh, so uh, I think maybe killing is okay because, well, we see killing all around us. Uh, it happened so much time before. So it is very natural to kill because everybody, I mean, we see it all around us. In, uh, it is not as if it has never happened. Uh, so since it's, it's somehow natural, so why would it be forbidden? Why would it be a bad thing to do, that kind of thing? So, I mean, that, 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 that would be an example of, um, <coughs> of trying to 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 uh, relate uh, moral judgments to factual judgments, and but of course the two are completely independent. It is not that because or or not because uh, something is actually the case that something should or should not be the case, and we cannot we cannot connect those two. Um, but if this is true, if if Hume is right about this, that morality never follows from from propositions that that are true or false. So let's say the truth on the, on the left side that is about propositions that can either be true or false, and propositions on the right side is about whether something is good or bad, and and if it is the case that indeed there is a guillotine between that that we can never derive good or bad from true or false, then we have of course a problem if we want to make machines that reason about morality because the reasoning about morality of those machines I mean what goes in goes out what comes out in some sense so logic is truth goes in truth goes out that's what logical principles are but now we want morality out we want to have the, this machine make the, mo the right moral decisions the responsible decisions but this machine cannot base it on what it observes or the kind of truths that we put in. So what I think what we need to do, we need to have a new kind of calculus, a calculus that is not uh, uh, calculating with truth values, but the calculus that is calculating with moral values. So then we have moral value in is moral value out. And who provides the moral value in for that kind of machines? We must do that. The machine cannot come up with the moral values itself. We need to put it in and then he, and the machine needs to calculate with those values and then it can make the right moral decisions. But we need to do that. Okay, so that is the main message. Uh, already George Hendrik von Wricht in 19, uh, 1957 thought about this kind of issue and he said, does logic have a wider reach than truth? So I presented logic as a game or like, no, as a mechanism that was calculating with truth values. Uh, truth goes in, truth goes out. But now I need, I, need, I need what comes out, the judgments or the actions that come out of the machine, I need them to be responsible or ethical, etc. And that means we cannot only have truths going in. What we need is uh, something more. And we need a calculus for that. And do we call that calculus still logic? That is a mystery. Well, okay, so here is my, uh, that's what, what my proposed solution to all this is. And I think then I will stop because I'm running out of time. So we will not get to the concrete examples anymore, but the main message I got across, I think. So my proposed solution is let us put in the morality ourselves. So we need to give the machines certain moral principles, general principles in a certain language. Uh, uh, and the machine itself needs to reason from the general moral principles to the more specific moral principles that are applicable for a certain situation and then it acts upon those, upon those considerations. That's the idea. But for that we need a calculus that is not calculating with truth like logic. No, we need a calculus that reasons with moral values, with good and bad. And uh, so I call that a moral calculus and we need to develop it because it's not ready. It, it, it's not there. Nobody did that. 
and I think we need to do that in order to make the machines responsible and to in order to make the machines ethical. We need to do that. Uh, well, we're doing it a little bit in the area of deontic logic. Maybe you've heard that term, term before. Deontic logic, so the problem there is that it is called logic. <laughs> Uh, well, I was saying logic is about truth values, about what, w how you preserve truth from input to output. But now I'm saying, actually, we need to, uh, to have other kinds of mechanisms that preserve uh, uh, morality from input to output. And we can actually therefore not call it logic. But that is a discussion. Uh, whether to call it logic or not, it is a mechanism and it, it has certain rules, it has certain principles, and we need to investigate that. Um, so that's what I think that wh what we what we need to do. Okay, and I think it's best to stop here because uh, I've spent uh, an hour now, and I suspect somehow that there will be uh, a few questions about this. Maybe especially about this second part, which was a little bit more abstract and uh, less easy to understand. Um, I already see. You. So uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure if there are questions, but maybe more arguments, because you gave us some arguments and there was already some discussion going on. I'm going all the way to back and you want to again, right? <laughs> I, saw, I, saw, I saw a small pen in the air, but hands are better. Yes, here we go. Hello. Yeah, um, just to put it out there, I am disagreeing with your point that strong AI is impossible. Um, I just like to ask, um, don't you think that your point about, you know, why strong AI is impossible is strongly based on the fact that uh, you're assuming that intelligence, that we're creating artificial intelligence in a human way. So especially your argument about language and the use of language, that it must be provoked by thought. Um, it's a human trait for sure, but uh, why are you assuming that it has to be a trait of artificial intelligence. Um, um, well, there is no other way of, according to me, if, if I think about this, I see no other way of thinking about it. I mean, the only example of intelligence we have are us. And now what you are suggesting is, yeah, maybe intelligence is not the kind of thing we are after when we say, of each other that we are intelligent, uh, but maybe it is something else. Okay, f I can understand that point, only then I'm lost for work, I, I no longer know what we are talking about. But I agree, if intelligence is not the kind of thing that we are thinking about when we look at ourselves, then machines may be able to do that kind of thing, but we don't know, then there will not be a good definition of what we are talking about. So that's why I'm looking at humans and I'm looking at what we call intelligence and I'm looking at inside what I think uh, is intelligent in me and then I, I see that's what we need to capture that's what we're aiming at and that is heavily dependent on language and on an inner world of thoughts and that we need to capture and that I'm trying to argue against but so in a sense you are right if intel if that is not what intelligence is and some but I would know I would not call that intelligence that's 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 the point it's almost as if the argument is like strong human intelligence is not possible, not artificial, because artificial, we could, you know, define it differently. Then we need to come up with a good definition for artificial yeah. intelligence. Yeah, okay, they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> but, but what is then, according to you, artificial intelligence? <laughs> okay. He said he doesn't know. It's just the way he's saying it. Okay. Back here somewhere, yes? Here? Yeah, I just have an idea. I, then you compare yourself. With, uh, all people are sitting over here, and we are in a debate. I I can fancy myself that there are a huge number of uh, machines that are here in a, in a, in a similar situation, the setup, are going to debate with each other. That's impossible. Well, no, <laughs> it is not impossible. I mean, I think we are machines. Yes. But not that kind of machine. I mean, not a Turing machine, but we are machines, def def obviously. I mean, yeah, okay, you can also debate that, actually. I think we are machines, but we are not the kind of machines uh, that, 
Well, it's not a Turing machine. It's a, a, a bounded Turing machine because it has a finite tape, etc. But that kind of machine, that kind of simple machines, that we are not. That's my only claim. Um, so I am a physicalist in philosophical terms. I think we are physical. So if 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 somebody is somehow able to make an exact copy of my physics and put it over there, then that person uh, will be um, just as intelligent, would have exactly the same intelligence, exactly the same subjective experience, it, it, because it is a material copy. So in that sense, I'm a physicalist. Um, it would also, it would be another person actually. That is of course a little bit mysterious. If it's an exact physical copy, and still it's another person. Why is, th why is that? But okay, that's another question. But I do not think that the kind of thing that, I'm, that I am can be copied in an, in, in an architecture like of, of the, the kind of technology that we have over there, like a Turing machine architecture, and that we can then say that we have a second uh, Jan uh, with exactly the same. That, I think, is impossible. And that's my position. The other way around, you're saying the machines are not uh, unique. Yeah. Um, but if they are able to learn, then yeah. they might be not unique, unique at the first, but then when what they've learned, they might have yeah. learned different things and the output is different. True. But so the, the kind of things that they are learned, is that then what makes the difference when we say, I am responsible and you are not. Uh, if you have two machines, one machine learns certain things, other things. Then, because then you always have the defense. Yeah, but I coincidentally learned those things and you coincidentally learn those things. Why should I be responsible only because I learned those things? You see, you see, there's something missing there. There's something, something strange going on. Yeah, um, here, right. Maybe first, uh, oh, the, oh you, it was not your turn, there was somebody, uh, <laughs> you, you will be next. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And, and I even have two questions. Um, the European Commission obviously don't want to wait for your ethical calculus solution. They are underway with legislation on AI, cryptocurrencies, digital markets, social media. Sorry. What is your opinion on that? That's the first question. Sorry, Second I, I missed. I think I missed it. My opinion on on the legislation ah. on EAI that's on its way in the European Union. Yeah. Second question: Many in the AI field who are aware of this legislation, and not many are, in my view, say, "Leave us alone. We want, we need AI science. Needs freedom." What is your opinion on that? They don't want legislation at all. Yeah. Yeah, I am not. I do not know enough about this legislation from the European Union. I think there is this legislation on data protection, etc., that is related. And there was this. Uh, that's what now comes to my mind. This idea, maybe that was also the European Union to grant citizenship or personhood to machines. Have you heard about that? That's already an older story. Yeah, yeah, no, that's true. I admit. No, 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 no. That's true. That's true. I repeat. Um, really. But I am actually in favor of legislation. Uh, so I think that is a good thing, even though I'm not aware of the latest legislation. So uh, because I'm much more working on the ethical side of things, uh, and one one com yeah maybe I have I mean what we what we have from the European level are these high-level ethical um, rules or ethical guidelines for developing AI um, and they are they are very high-level things like uh, never uh, I, 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 I should have brought some examples and I, I don't recall them but they are so high-level that when you're pr act practically building an AI, that it is very hard to implement them. Maybe there are there is a checklist for a look at your data, whether it is not biased or whether there is no data leakage between your training set and your validation set or something like that. All these gui guidelines, they, they that's quite concrete. Yeah, okay, but 
Um, I, I I'm a little bit. I mean, what I what I want is just ideas about how to program your AIs uh, so that they will behave ethically. And that is with these high level uh, recommendations for building AI, it is very hard to translate them to concrete, to concrete uh, ideas about how to develop an AI. And, and I think there's something missing there. I mean, the high level recommendations and the real practice uh, out there, that is something that we need to work on. Um, and the legislation is actually, I think, very good. Uh, although, but so the problem with the legislation, I think, is that it is very hard to define certain concepts uh, related to artificial intelligence. For instance, how would you define autonomy? I mean, everybody understands autonomous systems. Ah, there is maybe a little bit danger because autonomy has is the idea that things happen out of nowhere, things that happen by themselves or something like that. That's that's one intuition that you can have with autonomy. And if you have, uh, for instance, autonomous weapons, people are very afraid because autonomous weapons are they 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 have a will of their well. That's that's philosophical talk or or anthropomorphization. But you you see if 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 there is a machine out there that has a lot of capacity to do things on, on its own and it has weapons, that is scary. Um, so if you want to, uh, to come up with legislation to, uh, to uh, somehow get, get, get a hold on this or, or control this or regulate this, then you need to define what does it mean for a system to be autonomous. And then it becomes suddenly very technical. I mean, what is autonomy in that sense? What is the what are the kind of machines that are so autonomous that you would want to regulate them, or that you would want to come up with all kinds of legislation or rules in order to control them? Um, and and that is very difficult because autonomy is, in a sense, a philosophical con concept, and it is a, it is, I mean, is something more autonomous? when it has a bigger memory yeah probably because if it's just reacting on what immediately on its input it's not very autonomous because then people say it's just reacting on what it's get so for autonomy you need a big memory and maybe you need so you need to react on things that happened in the past it's one thing but there's many there's, i can i can think of five six other things that also come into autonomy and you need to you need to think all about that in order to come up with good rules. So I think, yes, it would be good if there would be good rules, but it will be very hard to put this in legislation because you have all these very difficult concepts that you need. The law needs to make it precise. Otherwise, you, people, people will be in court or people will, will get fined for something. Then it needs to be very clear. But the, the concepts that we are dealing with, like intelligence, autonomy, are very difficult to define. That's the problem. So I'm in favor of it, but it's going to be very hard. Okay. Uh, I have one question and maybe one statement, but let's start with the question. Uh, what would be a definition of uh, good and bad in uh, moral calculus? Huh? Maybe mathematical definition, like m more precise uh, one. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what is the definition of true and false in normal logic? Well, true is just what corresponds with what is actually the case. So a proposition is true. Okay, there's a. Uh, enormous amounts of philosophy be, be behind this that I'm not going to say, but okay, we, uh, we have an intuitive understanding what true means. Do we have an intuitive understanding what good means? That's much more difficult, <laughs> I agree. So, but the, the, the interesting thing is that maybe like in logic, well, logic is not about truth, but it is like a mechanism that when truth comes in, then truth comes out. So maybe we have that the same thing with morality. So if we don't know exactly what good is, but we could say that if this is good, then that is also good. And, and then we, for that we do not know, need to know exactly what good and bad are as long as we can reason with it and calculate with it. 
Why that's okay. maybe an answer. Uh, well, and I think uh, I'll continue with the statement, but uh, well, if we take two children, like they are more or less identical, if they are healthy and so on, so um, the behavior of children uh, like the same, approximately, and we cannot tell that w they are unique in some way like well, intelligently let's say it's just a body with a skeleton and uh, organs and a mind which learns and if we like if mother will lose the child in the forest and let's say like in a fairy tale tale uh, wolves will uh, raise uh, the chi the child it couldn't like relearn but still it's uh, like a person and we won't be able to say that in our uh, social environment it uh, the person will be responsible because it raised differently so let's return to the uh, deep learning ai so as a person behind me somewhere mentioned that it at I at the beginning it's not unique but later on it becomes unique mm -hmm. and uh, like the statement that one ai is learned not properly and mm -hmm. uh, like uh, it was given with the wrong information i think the statement is uh, false because well what is proper information guess mm -hmm. As I said previously, if children is raised by wolves. It doesn't ma doesn't mean that he has yeah. given the wrong information. Yeah, I I think um I I don't have a good answer to you. I mean I I also see the 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 the, the difficulties with this argumentation. Uh, um, I mean for me this. Yeah, this this uniqueness is very important for responsibility, and yeah, at this point I can I can know I mean I cannot offer you more than what I already said, but I I see your point. Um, uh, it it is difficult, um, and I think I need to leave it at that. Ah, uh, I just would like to mention about self-driving cars. Uh, several years ago, uh, a really popul uh, popular self-driving ca uh, car crashed, and uh, I was thinking about that. It is um, so. Who is the responsible about yeah. it? Uh, because the uh, car a actually has a, I think, strong AI, yeah. because uh, the uh, software side is not. Uh, is not just if a statement. It is more than that, uh, and it's not uh, co controllable because uh, software developers can maybe define the uh, mathematical side and the functions, but at some point it is really impossible to control it. And for uh, for uh, the side of the factory, it's also impossible to control it. So. Uh, it is, I think, uh, a responsibility of the uh, freedom of the machine. So maybe we can define, I, I, I'm not sure about it, uh, but maybe we can define the uh, responsibility according to freedomness. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just thinking, ab thinking about it. And maybe uh, uh, um, for the legislation side, maybe a, an electronic uh, identity can be defined to um, to control their freedomness because they also have uh, a freedom to decide about something for for at least the self-driving cars case. Uh, that's a lot of questions at the same time. Um, yeah, um, the self-driving car. Um, I think so. One thing you said is that self-driving cars are maybe strong AI because they have become so complicated and the kind of reasoning that's going on there we do not control it so maybe there's something in there that can be I, I, I don't think I think this is just 
an example of something that has become too complicated to comprehend for everyone. Uh, so this, this third way of, of, of uh, programming things, namely the way where we annotate, that's, that's how solving driving car companies uh, actually do it. Eh? So they annotate a lot of data and they, they all this data they, they put through their uh, learning algorithm and then the, machi the machine knows the, it's all the objects around it. But of course it doesn't know anything and we do not know what it does not know and what it does know actually. We, do, we can only judge that kind of machines by looking at how it behaves. Uh, we have no other guarantee at all. So with the other forms of programming we can have guarantees but with this form of programming by annotating data we have no guarantee at all how it will behave. The only thing we can do is just, okay, let uh, we train it, it behaves, and then, uh, okay, we can be fairly sure that it will behave all the time like that. But you are completely right, we have lost control there. But, and that's why that's dangerous. I mean, that because we cannot know what the output will be. So there is, uh, so one, so Aristotle said, there's two very important aspects of responsibility. One is control, uh, whether you are, you are responsible for a certain outcome as an agent, if you control the outcome, if you have no control, of course, you cannot be responsible for it. So, but this, okay, this, 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 this machine or indirectly the people be, uh, behind the self-driving car, they are responsible because they somehow do control what the output is. But the problem is, and that's the second part of, of Aristotle's criterion for responsibility, is that you need to know what the outcomes will be. So it's a knowledge criterion and that's what lacking in your example. It's, so I think it's just weak AI where we lost knowledge we lost control of what the outcome is because we don't know and that's because we use the, the wrong kind of programming namely deep learning and uh, etc where we do not know what the outcome is not with any guarantee or any certainty and so that's simple but it has for me that has nothing to do with strong ai that's just weak ai where we lost uh, our responsibility because we lost control in the sense that we don't know what's going on exactly uh, people of course try to uh, 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 repair this deficiency by thinking of all kinds of combinations and well it's a huge um, a scientific area now that's interpretability of um, or sub-symbolic uh, uh, systems uh, like uh, deep learning etc so looking at uh, at these networks and see heat maps for instance and uh, counterfactual techniques well there's all kinds of things uh, so people try to do something about that about this lack of knowledge of what the output will be in certain situations but you can never guarantee like you have in law in logic you can guarantee because you have a proof or even in the other way of programming things you can still have certain fair you can be fairly certain that certain outputs will result from certain inputs and that you lose with uh, deep learning but it, for me that has nothing to do with strong AI and but maybe that's not related to something that you uh, asked. I think self-driving cars will be there and they will be, uh, they will employ weak AI uh, and it will be uh, maybe five years from now or something like that, that they will be fairly common actually. Um, so you don't need, str you don't need strong AI for self-driving cars. That's not, not everybody agrees with me actually. Some people think that for self-driving cars you actually need strong AI I'm not sure I no. actually I don't think so. we've got about five minutes left I saw two questions and then we have to finish so one here and then in the back they're in the back yeah all right um, so first of all thank you Jan for the insightful lecture I have neither a background in ethics or computer science rather in health sciences but I wanted to ask you something which I found interesting. This is something that I hear a lot when I hear like, when we use in the health field, medical technologies with AI, there are some ethical issues. And I hear a lot the argument that AI <laughs> cannot really be strong AI because it doesn't have a full range of emotions. So. First of all, to ask my question, I would have to ask you first, um, do you find that strong AI would have to have a full range of human emotion? 
I, I think the definition of strong AI is that it has a full range of human emotions. That okay. yeah, I, for me that comes when I think of, of of the term strong AI, then I immediately think in all in all respects like us. Okay, not all of us have strong emotions. I agree, but <laughs> at least it needs to have the capacity to somehow have strong emotions. Or right, because yeah. I find for us, even if we don't have the ability to read another human's face to see if they are happy or sad, yeah. a psychotherapist will give us images. This is a sad face. This is a happy face. Yeah. And we compute in our daily life. And we use that. For example, people with uh, autism who are on the spectrum, autism yeah. spectrum. Or then again, we have people who don't have necessarily regret. People who, yeah. for example, have a Sociopath. narcissistic yeah. or sociopathic or psychopathic yeah. personality disorder. We hold those people responsible in yeah. front of law, in front of policy. Yeah. Yet, yeah, very AI doesn't have the same standard. They are held yeah. to a higher standard than humans. Yeah. Which I find strange. I mean, I'm very interested in policy. That's uh, yeah. more my field. Well, okay. So that's that's why a I good wanted point. to ask your opinion on this matter. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, I think. Yeah, that is, uh, I mean, the AI is held to a higher standard indeed. And that is uh, fascinating. And th th there's many ways to, to so for instance, take the example of the self-driving cars. I mean, if you look objectively how good the current self-driving cars are, they are much better than humans. Um, uh, still we don't allow them and when there is one accident then people are oh and that is because we only look at the things that go wrong and we don't see all the lives that are saved actually by i mean we are terrible drivers uh, we fall asleep we are distracted we see we are on our iphones we cause all kinds of problems that's not what the what the self-driving car does so if you just do put the self-driving cars on the street it will be much safer but there will be different deaths <laughs> so people will still die but not the people that are uh, as the result of of somebody being distracted by their iphone but for other and uh, you see we are only focus on uh, so that's one so they are held to a, but okay this will be my but i i want to have this question of the younger person in the, in the back that we do that later uh, but uh, this would be a, a nice end note. I think there's another reason why uh, machines are being held to a higher standard because when a self-driving car kills a certain person or um, runs into a person and it makes a mistake, then immediately we think this self-driving car made a mistake and we have millions of other self-driving cars that are just like that and will that will make the same mistake. So let's just this, we cannot allow, let's do something about it. That's because they are not unique. They are all alike. They're all the same machines. And when, when there is a programming thing in there that does something wrong, they do, all of them do that wrong. So that's why we, that's one reason why we hold them to a higher standard because when we see something that they're doing, we know that it is not like a human that make, sometimes makes a mistake and it has a free choice. No, it doesn't have a free choice. It is being programmed like that. And that's why we hold them to a higher standard, because one mistake is replicated millions and millions of times in all other cars. So that's why we do that. That's one reason, I think. Unlike, yeah, okay, there is, there is again a similarity with humans. That's true. That's, yeah, okay. Yes. You say that AI is. Uh, you say that AI isn't able to learn things because they only follow things that humans say. But aren't humans the same? Because humans also follow things humans say. Humans are also learn things by yeah. humans. Yeah. I'm. I, I think I did not meant to say that machines do not learn anything. I. I, I think. There is learning, of course. The, the the deep learning is about learning. Those machines 
first they have erratic input output behavior then you show them with this input you typically should have that output and you show them a lot of examples of that for instance recognize a tree in a picture you, you show them a, a, a picture with a tree and then you say the output is tree and you do that with a lot of pictures and then suddenly it gets the functionality that with most trees you get the answer it is a tree so that's input output uh, you learn the so in that sense the machine learns and in that sense it does things that maybe it did not was not able to do before and with computers in general I said okay they do not do anything that we did not put in that's true I, I think I said that as Lady Lovelace, uh, Lovelace uh, objection but you could say that is also true for that example that I gave somehow we put in that if it gets enough examples of this then it gets roughly that output then it would do that it's still we decided still we make this low level algorithm such that it learns so in that sense it doesn't learn does not learn anything really new because we control the learning <laughs> okay you had another question thank you jan this yeah, okay. was the end yet yeah, it's half okay. past uh, nine if somebody still has an urgent question, do come forward and ask Jan Broersen personally. I thank you for coming. Um, I thank you for this uh, philosophical insight in AI. And I really like the arguments from the audience also. Uh, so it's a very nice topic to ar keep arguing about. Um, I don't want to argue about what you're going to do, but you can choose <laughs> to go to the cafe and have a drink or, of course, go and learn and study at home or go to bed and sleep. And I do hope to see you back at any of the other lectures of Studium Generale. Thank you again, Jan Broers. Thank you. <laughs>